So let's let's blow open the topic now then of emergence. Yeah. Because that's a great a topic of great fascination, especially in biology. But to the extent that that can apply to other systems, that would be amazing to get some insight into what's going on on the frontier where we don't understand what's going on. And for and just just because you and Neil and and most Gary probably too because he did all the research on this. Can you please define emergence? Because I hear people use the term, and I think a lot of times they're not using it correctly. So can you please yeah. just tell us what is emergence? That, that's, a, that's a completely fair observation. I spend most of my life, you know, in, in horror. Uh, so, okay. First of all, I want to say it's a difficult concept, and I think it would be completely accurate to say that we still have huge amounts of work to do uh, to understand formally what it means. But I'm now going to, having said all that little caveat, I'll, I'll tell you what I think it is. So let's just start with physics, because it's easy. So we just talked about it. We talked about gases, like the kinetic theory of gases, put loads of those particles together, right? And you can get solids at the right temperatures and pressures, and you can get fluids. And it turns out that the mathematical equations you use to describe those two systems are different, right? And the dimension, the simplicity, if you like, the number of terms in those equations are different. And so we like fluid dynamics because it's, it's actually quite an elegant way of describing the behavior of loads and loads of particles in a particular temperature and pressure. That is emergence. The fact that you have two things, a new state of matter with properties that wouldn't really seem to apply at the individual particle level, and it has a new language, a new language of description, and a new language of prediction. Those are the two hallmarks. Now, it's interesting you were talking about psychology, advertising, and neuroscience. Mm. And that's a beautiful example. So let's imagine, right, that in order to be a really good psychologist or marketer, you had to be a great neuroscientist. Of course, a really good marketer doesn't need to be a good neuroscientist because all of that detail is a little bit like a particle in a gas relative to a fluid. A good marketer is doing something like fluid dynamics by analogy. They're understanding collective properties that have their own language, right? And I think a lot of kind of pseudoscience, to be honest, is where a level that has its own perfectly adequate language starts using the more reductionist language to give it legitimacy. So emergence, one, new states or phases of matter or organization, two, uh, new languages and descriptions, typically mathematical, it doesn't have to be, right? And, and three, the, the tricky one is not everything deserves to be called emergent. And so finding that emergent level uh, is actually part of the challenge. And, and a lot of, we would argue, a lot of economic theory would be better off being replaced by psychology because the language it's derived or invented doesn't really work. It's not like fluid dynamics. So the failures of emergence are also really interesting. Cool, man. So when you get to the, st the state of emergence, what is, what is the prediction accuracy for you being able to say, this is most likely gonna be happening here? Yeah, that, that's, actually, that's actually the criterion, right? That if you'll allow me, I'm gonna use another analogy. Go for it helps. It. Okay. So let's say that I'm proving a mathematical theorem, okay? The way that works, you write down your axioms, right? Your assumptions, you put down your equations, and then you have a bunch of um, a, a kind of a toolkit for doing deduction. You apply calculus or group theory, or whatever you like, and out pops an answer, right? And the correctness of that answer has nothing to do with your psychological state, nothing to do with what you have for breakfast in the morning, nothing to do with the economy, but nothing to do with neurons. It has to do with the formal logic of mathematics. And that's the most beautiful example of emergence for me, because you wouldn't gain additional insight into the correctness of a proof by knowing what the neurons were doing. They're irrelevant. And the technical term for that is screened off. Truly emerging phenomena screen off microscopic degrees of freedom. That's some fancy language. And we know it's true, right? But we know it's true of mathematics. It's probably the best example, I think, of a truly emergent language. And because, to your point, it does predict, it does deduce, you do get to the right answer, right? You don't have to go down. So I'm curious about something here. So when we look at flocking birds, yeah, 
that is a macroscopic group behavior where, as far as I understand it, you cannot, there's no known way to analyze a single bird in any way that will tell you that in the company of other birds it will flock. And I've always thought of emergence as just such a system. And you hinted to that with the, the gas particle and the, the, and the gas as a fluid or as a solid or as a gas. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depending on temperature and pressure. So the molecule as a solid liquid or gas. So would you agree that these other kinds of systems you can't, you can't look at a termite and say, one day it will build a termite mound. Is it because we don't know enough about it? Do we need to be more reductive or less reductive in our analysis of the organism to know what it would do macroscopically in a group? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So I think sometimes that and sometimes the opposite. So let me again give you an example. <laughs> <laughs> so you're no, right. Because, yeah, he's right. Yeah, 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 no, no, it, it's really interesting because let's say it's sort of interesting, right? If, if you said, I know everything about the neuroscience of an ant, right? Or, or, or termite or, mm. or a starling, you know? Yep. I know about fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics, I know what feathers do, I know how far they can see, you know, all of that. So I could predict if I put a bunch of them together how they would behave. And I think that there are going to be cases where that is true. But that doesn't mean emergence isn't still useful, because you might say, yes, I can. I needed deep thought, the computer from, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right, to work it out. And it took the lifetime of the universe to do so, but I could do it, as opposed to, you know what, Neil, I've got a pencil and paper here. I'm going to write down my little emergent theory, and I'm going to do it in five seconds. And so there is a side to emergence, which is just about... Um, Practicality. Efficiency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Efficiency. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So okay. we're going to see right. a, an equation on a T-shirt sometime soon. We have many of those. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have too many too of many, them. Too many, many problems. Right. All right. Well, yeah, let's. Yeah. I mean, Chuck mentioned AI earlier on, and we don't want to roll it down the hill because it's too expensive. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you predict the emergence of consciousness in something like an AI? Wow. Or define the complexity of life itself. Oh, in this context. I want to go even deeper, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, I mean, why not? Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, and wouldn't that kind of be the same? Because if, if an AI really does have emergent consciousness and e truly, truly emergent intelligence, then, it's life. then it really is us at that point. It's just us or at it, that or point. Is it? in, in a, no, it's us in a different form. Well, let's find out. Okay, yeah. let's find out. <laughs> I might gonna I might annoy you now. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, so the first thing I would say is that AIs have no intelligence. Right. Okay. And then we'll discuss what that means. Mm -hmm. But they have tons of capability. And and, and I tell you the difference. I mean, here's my thought experiment. I was asked these kind of zealots of the technocratic era, which is the following. You have two students, okay? And let's call them A and B. And you set them the same exam. It's just a general knowledge quiz, right? And they come back, we've got all the answers right, all right? And I said to you, which is the better student? You say, I don't know, they've got the same answer. Now I say to you, you know, A did the exam in the library where every time a question came up, they looked up the answer. And B actually took the exam, I don't know, in the, by the side of the ocean, you know. And you said, well, clearly B is the better student. Now the problem is, so knowledgeable, we know the difference between fake knowledgeable and real knowledgeable because we can ask, did you do it in a library or not? And the problem with a lot of AI at the moment is it's basically fake intelligence as far right. as I'm concerned. It's a very quick lookup. It's really just- It's very quick, essentially a really clever lookup. Uh, it's a plus, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's not an amazing technology, I'm just saying, but it's a very capable technology. If you ask, and again, now we get to intelligence, kind of my field, what is intelligence? Intelligence is basically someone or something that makes a hard problem easy. Mm. If you went to school and you're sitting down trying to work out a problem, you look over at the person next to you and they've made a problem look effortless, you'd say, oh my God, that's, that's pretty intelligent. No, 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 that yeah. you're, was, you're the intelligent one looking over the shoulder because right. you got the answer easier than they did. Yeah, <laughs> they, that's true. Right. That, that's like a strategic intelligence. If I may echo your story with an example I give often, Yes. where let's say I'm an architect and I'm gonna hire a, a summer intern 
and they, they're both the same on paper. Right. right. And so I, th therefore they get to come in for an interview, right? And I want to pick one from the interview. Okay. And this is a contrived example, but I think you'll agree, David, that the there's a church steeple outside my window. Mm -hmm. And I say, just for grins, uh, how tall is that church steeple? And the first person says, oh, it's 135 feet. I will say, well, how do you know? Well, I'm, I memorized all the church steeple heights. That it's a thing I do. The other person says, I don't know. I'll be right back. It goes away for 10 minutes, then comes back and says, somewhere between 130 and 140 feet. And I said, well, how did you find out? He said, well, I know how tall I am, and I measured my shadow. Then I measured the shadow of the church steeple, and then I did some simple math to get this answer. Who are you going to hire? I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to hire the, the second guy. The, sec the second one. Because clearly what he was able to do was problem solve. I, I didn't solve. say he or she, but oh, that's okay. I said he. I'm yes. sorry. The, I'm, I apologize. To because they, <laughs> they were able to. Yes. <laughs> because Good they save. He saved. were yeah. able to problem solve. To, to problem solve. And, and, and is my example resonate with you here? Yeah, very much so. And I think you can see where you notice, right, that in the era of the Turing test, the imitation game, you just ask how high is the steeple? And if it gives you the right answer, you say, look, there you go. It's indistinguishable from another human being. But you then went a bit further and asked for an explanation, mm. right? Tell me how you arrived at that answer. Prove to me you understand. And I think these ideas of it, understanding and explanation are really important to intelligence and under-discussed in place of what Alan Turing did, and you know, he's my compatriot, I love him, but uh, the idea of the Turing test did a lot of harm because it allows for this possibility essentially of cheating. I had not thought about it that way, but yeah. you've just convinced me uh, because that's that's the, the litmus test that has always been applied. Right. And then everyone is left thinking there's intelligence on the other side. Right. But, if the, but David just unpacked that into and lays it bare for what it is. However, in defense of Turing, I think it was just the wrong terminology because basically the idea was you wouldn't know the difference. That was the test. You would not know the difference. Correct, correct. So he's not necessarily saying that they're the same. He's just saying that one is represented in a way that is indistinguishable from Unless the other. Unless you went further and said, how did you figure this well, out? Well, now you just screwed him. <laughs> <laughs>